Welcome back. This is the second course on quantum field theory. And I assume that you have taken the first course that I gave over NPTEL. So before we proceed, let me first tell you the books that I have used um, for preparing these lectures and you will also find them useful books and other sources. So first one is not necessarily I have used all of them, but uh, it will be useful to know these books. So the first one is Weinberg. This is Quantum Theory of Fields. Quantum Theory of Fields. I am writing in short. This is volume 1. Okay. Then second book is by George Sturman. This is an introduction to quantum field theory. To quantum field theory. Okay, again I write in short. And then a few more I will write. So a book by Raymond. And this is Field Theory, a Modern Premier. A modern premier or maybe primer. Primer, okay. I used to wrongly call it premier. Okay, and then um, also a book by Z. This is quantum field theory in a nutshell. Quantum field theory in a nutshell. Okay, and there are many other books uh, in the market and you can choose whichever you like the most. And also uh, lectures by Ashok Sen, Ashok Sen. His lectures you can find on YouTube. Okay. Uh, on quantum field theory and that will also be very useful and we will also uh, refer to those lectures. So these are roughly the uh, books which uh, references which we are going to follow in this course and you would be benefiting by looking at them. Okay, so as like last time we are going to have this course run for 12 weeks and you are going to get frequently assignments. I will keep that those assignments uh, very simple. Um, so let's um, let's recall what we were doing last time in the previous course. We were studying quantum field theory and we looked at um, free theory and then we looked at interacting theories we talked about their symmetries and what conservation laws they give rise to and what conserved charges they give rise to. Okay, um, now um, the goal here in this course is to work out in detail what lies in quantum field theories or more precisely interacting quantum field theories. Okay, and uh, we will be concentrating on scalar field theories, but nevertheless, the formalism that I'm going to develop here will be useful for other fields as well. So, um, most, most of it actually. So, you, we do not lose anything by restricting, restricting ourselves to scalar field theories. Um, so, let's start by asking okay let, let's put it this way what is the typical experiment that is done in high energy physics okay i'm going to phrase it in terms of high energy physics but um, the things which we do in this course are not limited to energy physics. They are applicable to other other fields as well, like condensed matter and um, 
quantum optics and these things but i will restrict to uh, a discussion to high energy physics as far as um, setting up the experiment is concerned so a typical experiment is the following um you you collide some particles and you measure some particles you you find some particles in the final state that's typically what you do okay for example you might have heard of the large hadron collider okay where you collide two proton beams or let's say two protons okay and then you de detect things in the detector in the final state and you must have heard of higgs boson being detected at the lhc and many other things are measured there let me um, talk about um, a machine or a collider that was that existed before lhc and it was called lep lep stands for large electron positron collider okay large electron positron collider okay positron is a anti particle corresponding to electron okay so uh, here what you do is you take an electron and a proton and shoot them at each other at very high energies okay how a high is not so relevant for what i'm going to discuss but at very high energies and they they collide and then they produce something in the final state which you which you see in your detectors okay, that's a typical experiment and when you talk about lhc it is just little more complicated because actually a lot more complicated but one of the complications come um uh, comes in because your initial state is not a fundamental particle but it's a proton which has many particles inside it and that's why i'm more um, inclined towards talking in terms of lep it's more easy to talk so suppose you are doing an experiment at the lep where you fire an electron towards a positron and they meet and collide and produce something what is that you would want to ask or even before that let's see what comes out of those collisions so so typically what will happen is you will get many different outcomes so suppose you collide one electron and one positron let's say first first collision happens okay and you get two photons in the final state that's one possible outcome and that you can detect in the detectors you will you'll see two those two photons coming out with some energy and some momenta okay by momenta it's clear that depending on the momenta they will be going in different directions now think of colliding the next um, set of electrons and positrons so the second set comes in they collide and they might not produce two photons this time they might produce two z bosons in the final state that's a possible outcome let's collide the third one third set an electron and positron you might get again a final state which contains two photons so you detect this time two photons in the final state so these electrons and positrons they disappear and they leave behind two photons that's another outcome let's collide the fourth one and this time you might get a uh, two w bosons in the final state fifth one you collide you may get 10 different particles in the final state okay so you see there are many different outcomes that are possible given the same initial state so i'm not changing the initial state i still have the same electron the same proton uh, positron coming it coming in with the same energy okay they both disappear but they produce something else in the final state okay so there are several possibilities and what you would like to know is the following what you would like to know is what is the probability that if i fire an electron 
with this momentum and a positron with this momentum okay i don't have to specify energy because masses are known so mass uh, energy gets fixed and if i choose this initial state where these two particles have these specified momenta what is the probability that i will produce a final state number 1 or final state number 2 or final state number 3 okay and this specification of final state is not just about telling which particles are produced it's also about with what momentum they are produced okay so even though uh you might be producing a number of particles in the final state which have some momenta a uh, second outcome will could be same same particles again in the final state but with different momenta okay so an experiment can measure this so and for precisely for those reasons you have those machines so experiment can measure and if you believe that you have a theory which is correctly going to describe electromagnetic interactions electrodynamic interactions or electroweak interactions then you take your model which you believe is a description of those interactions calculate these probabilities probability of these events which i have talked about and see what you get and if your results agree with what experiments uh, have to tell you then you can have a belief that you have gotten a reasonably good model of these interactions okay so that's the goal the goal is to predict the probability of a given initial state to emerge as a given final state okay if we know these things then we know the uh, dynamics of the theory okay that's that's what the prediction would be from the theory side okay so that's what we want to do so let me just write down here so as i was saying you could take an electron i will write as e minus and a positron the symbol for a positron is e plus okay and these two collide and they might annihilate to give you two photons gamma is a symbol reserved for photons or they could in another event give you two z bosons okay or another possibility in fact there are many many possibilities i am going to list down only a few they may give two w bosons and they may give n number of particles whatever you wish let's say for the sake of saying 10 particles moving in different directions okay these are all different po possibilities and you would like to predict what's the probability amplitude or probability of this appearing as this state or this initial state appearing at this initial state uh, this final state and so forth okay once we know uh, this entire set i can or even for a smaller set of final state and i can go and match with the experiment okay and then i can either conclude that what i have is a good description of the interaction or what i have is pretty useless because it does not match with the experiments okay so either way okay so now that we have um told what the goal is let's try to find out how to answer this question okay so let me go to the next slide how are we going to find out so let me be a little bit more um, let, let me throw in more details about the the scattering process i was describing so typically it is like this so you have um, an electron coming in from this side and a positron coming from this side okay so an experimentalist has prepared this state so where he or she knows 
the momentum with which this electron is fired, the momentum with which this positron is fired that is known to you. You have prepared that state. Okay. Uh, of course, you know the masses of these particles and then it's come, going to come out of some, let's call it loosely as a nozzle. So it's going to come out from some nozzle. So you know where that electron was located at some time, okay, at some, some point of time and same for here. So you roughly know or you very precisely know where that electron was located and with what momentum it was moving at, at some time and same for this one. Okay, So you have prepared a state in which you specify the momenta, uh, the energies and locations of those particles at some, at some time. Okay, um, consistent with Heisenberg uncertainty principles. Of course, you cannot say that the momentum is precisely this. You have to take into account the Heisenberg uncertainty relations. Now, this state where it contains two particles and these two particles are far apart okay, from each other. Um, and because they are far apart, they are effectively not interacting with each other. Okay, so that's the initial state. They do not feel each other. They are far apart. So non-interacting particles, and I know there are two particles, these electron and positron, and they then start coming closer and closer because they have been fired. So they, they come closer and closer. At some point of time, they start feeling each other. Okay, and then something happens and that is what we want to know what happens and something happens some other particles might get produced let's say two photons but i cannot say that uh, when i'm in that region where the interaction is happening okay i cannot say that because remember uh, for an interacting theory the number of particles is not conserved okay that's true in free theory but not in interacting theory so this notion of how many particles are there all this is not applicable here it's lost so i cannot say that there are two particles or three particles or whatever but something has happened uh, this state where you had two particles and the way i describe that state is evolving with time and remember i'm looking at schrodinger picture because now states are evolving with time they this evolves with time and then it produces some state at time t equal to 0 and t equal to 0 is the time I am going to um, use for uh, that time when these two when these two start feeling uh, each other appreciably so that we can say that the states are interact I mean this there is interaction going on okay so they feel each other at time t equal to 0 and of course as you can guess um, it's arbitrary which one you call t equal to zero. If you take a moment earlier or a moment later, it doesn't matter. So sometime you choose arbitrarily. Okay, so they come closer and then the state evolves again. And when you have waited long enough, this state will evolve into a state which will have fixed number of particles, maybe two photons, which are far apart from each other so that you can say that you have gotten two photons or two z bosons okay so what has happened is a state with a definite number of particles which are far apart from each other has evolved into another state which has a definite number of particles which are far apart okay so if you look at let's refer to time t equal to zero so compared to time t equal to zero this state so t equal to zero i do not know how many there, there is no such notion of how many particles these notions is left uh, is lost but if you take the state at t equal to zero okay and go backwards in time when you go backwards in time long enough you will see that that state started appearing as a state with an electron and a positron okay so the state at t equal to zero when evolved backwards in time into far past is a state 
with a definite number of particles which are well localized in space remember it was in the nozzle at some point of time and well localized in momenta okay you fired it with some some momentum okay so that's your that's the state in the far past so let me write it down the state at t equal to 0 and remember t is arbitrary when you go backwards in time it gives you a state with definite number of particles which are well separated from each other and have well defined momenta and location okay so this is something in far past and similarly if you were to start with the state at t equal to 0 to which this initial state has evolved to and if you were to evolve it to the far future that is you wait long enough again you have states with state uh, a state which has definite number of particles which are well separated from each other and have well defined momenta Okay, and the restriction given by Heisenberg uncertainty, uncertainty relations has to be uh, taken into account. So you cannot say that momentum is precisely this because then your particle could be anywhere. Okay, but you can construct Gaussian wave packets and fairly localize both in momentum and position space. Okay, so I know that I am repeating a lot, but that's worth doing because this otherwise it appears unnecessarily difficult okay so what we have done is state t equal to zero when evolved far in past it looks like well separated particles with well defined momentum and location similarly the same state same state evolved far in future looks like again well separated particles with well defined momentum and position okay now let's um, concentrate on the right hand side uh, state at t equal to 0 evolving in far future okay and that is what I want to focus on first so if so let's let's again repeat what I have said so at the state at t equal to 0 could evolve into those many different possibilities which I was listing okay it could evolve into this or it could evolve into that or is this could evolve into this or that okay and whatever is possible it could evolve into this and that okay and of course when you measure you get only one of those so it makes sense that the state at t equal to zero you decompose into a basis states into a set of basis states where a given basis state would evolve if you were to take that basis state and if you were to evolve it into far future you are going to get let's say this one okay so there would be some basis state which when evolved into far future is going to give you two well separated photons with this momentum and that momentum okay similarly there will be another basis state which when you evolve into far future would give you 
only two Z bosons. Similarly, a third basis state which will give you this, a fourth, this and so forth. So the state at t equal to zero is a state which is an, in, in a linear combination of states which when evolved into far future will give you either this or that or that or that depending on the coefficients uh, which are multiplying those basis states right a super so you construct a superposition where you have uh, this linear sum of all the basis states with some coefficients and depending on the coefficients the probability of finding that state in the final state um, I mean, the probability of getting that state in the final state is determined by those coefficients. So the point I want to make is the state at t equal to zero should be a linear combination of states which when evolved into far future give you these states. Okay, that's what I want to convey. Now, um, I do not know at this moment much about what these basis state states are, what they look like, and that's something which we are going to do um, in the next few lectures with a lot of care. But I can say something, at least I can put some labels on these states. So let's say what these labels would be. So um, if I say that now what I will do is, uh, I will forget about, not forget, but I will not be really looking at electrodynamics because I, my interest is in 5 4 theory in this case or where all the same kind of particles are there. It's not different kinds of particles, you have only one field. Okay. So in the final state you will be measuring particles which are excitations of this field phi. So, But if you wish, you can keep thinking in terms of electrons and positrons and Z bosons and whatever. Okay, or let's let's keep it thinking that way. Okay, it, it is useful. So let's let's not worry about this at the moment. So um, you will have some state alpha. Let's call that alpha, which is a basis state. So, um, and def depending on what are these uh, different labels that alpha contains, you will get one basis state or, the, or another basis state. Okay? So, there will be some say, such states alpha which will evolve to those states in the far future. So, what could be the possible labels? Well, we could label them like this. We could say that since this state evolves to a state which has let's say two particles like two photons with momentum p1 and p2 i can label the state alpha like this now i uh, don't think of this as a state which has uh, these two particles carrying momentum p1 and p2 that's not how you have to think about it. As I said, at t equal to zero, so I'm. You see, the basis I'm basis states I'm uh, talking about at t equal to zero. So whatever I'm doing is at t equal to zero, and at t equal to zero, there is no such notion, right? Particle number is not conserved. There is no such notion. So, but since this this state, this basis state, by definition, when evolve to far future, gives me two particles far apart with momentum p1 and p2 i will use this as the label okay and in fact i will uh, put a subscript out here okay which means that this is a state when you evolve in far future that is the outcome okay final state outcome uh, the outcome which i specified earlier okay so um, now, if your theory contains only scalar particles, there is nothing else which you need to specify. 
if you had electrons and positrons and photons then you know you, you can also you need to also put other labels like charges and other things but since i am interested in only fifo theory i don't need to put any other labels it's the momentum which is the only label and energy is not a independent label because the masses of the particles will be known and once the masses are known the energies are uh, fixed by knowing the momenta okay so what i have argued till now is that at time t equal to 0 there has to be a set of basis states which will be labeled which can be labeled like this okay and these evolve to those states and there will be a lot of such states right it's not just two particles as i said you could produce 10 particles also so there will be another state which will have some momentum p1 some momentum p2 okay another particle carrying momentum p3 and p10 and we also put this subscript out okay and at this moment i am not telling you what this state contains what it looks like we do not know that's something we'll figure out later so in general we can say the following that at t equal to 0 we have a set of basis states which can be labeled as the following p1 p2 pn okay where and we'll take different values and we have put a subscript out okay and these basis states should form a complete set right because any final state we should be able to write as a linear sum of these basis states so you multiply with appropriate coefficients but once you have taken all the basis states whatever final state you get can be expressed in terms of these basis states so that they should form a complete set okay so we have found one set of uh, states which we call out states and um, now let's look at the state at t equal to 0 and repeat the same thing which i have said for um, for when you look at the thing at as time goes backwards okay so we want to see what happens at uh, as time goes backwards so till now the experiment i have been describing had only two particles an electron and a positron in the initial state but that's not necessary you could imagine 10 particles coming together and colliding right or 20 particles coming together and colliding you could have you could collide five electrons and 17 positrons together okay so that's another um, uh, one thing to keep in mind it's not just two particles in the initial state so all these particles would come and interact and create a state at t equal to 0 okay and we start from that state at t equal to 0 and let's look let's move backwards in time and see what happens so whatever state you have at t equal to 0 when you go backwards in time okay it will correspond to some state it will give you some state which contains definite number of particles with those definite momenta and definite location okay so repeating the same arguments exactly the same arguments we can argue that again at time t equal to 0 we get another set of basis states which we can label as q1 that's the momentum of part one particle momentum of another particle and so forth i am putting m which is distinct from n because the number of particles in the initial state and the final state could be distinct okay and i say and i also put a label n okay so you could the state at t equal to 0 you could uh, write as a linear combination of these n states so these are called n states this this is all standard 
terminology out states okay so you could um, express the state at t equal to 0 in terms of this in states and also in terms of out states okay and of course these states are these basis states are not belonging to different hilbert spaces they belong to the same hilbert space and you are talking about the same same uh, same system at t equal to 0 good so now that i have at least given a um, um, give I have at least labeled the in announced states even though I have not provided any description now I can ask my question again how do I uh, what's the probability of some initial state at in far past or t equal to minus infinity to appear as some other final state in far future at t going to plus infinity okay what's that probability now that answer is contained in the following if you could answer what is the probability of a given in state or the probability amplitude of a given in state to appear as a given out state then your job is done because once you have this information you can answer uh, the, the the question what's the probability amplitude of an initial state in the far past to appear as a final state in the far future okay so our question about those probabil uh, um, probabilities of the events in in the collider can be now cast into the following question and the question is this what is the probability amplitude What is the probability amplitude that this in state, let's call it P1, P2, Pn, of this? to appear as okay i'm not being very careful with whether i have used p1 for the in states or out states okay doesn't matter these are labels okay this pm okay or more precisely what I want to know is this following object so I have start I start with um, this in state and I want to know this object This should be Q. Out state. Okay, so that is the object uh, we want to calculate, and this is called the S matrix element, which is you, we can write it as the following. Um, so this is what we want to know. And this I will define as S Q1, Q2 up to QM, P1, P2 up to Pn. Okay, so this is the S matrix element, that's the definition of S matrix element, and that is what we want to calculate. Okay, I hope it's clear why we want to calculate such an object because once you know about this object, you you can just uh, easily calculate 
what will be the probability amplitude of an initial state appearing as a final state because apart from these matrix elements there is nothing else right other other than is just the uh, how you create wave packets those those functions that you multiply in front of these in the in front of these um, in states and out states basis states okay so the question is clear and this is what we are going to spend um, a lot of time with and we'll try to derive a expression for the s matrix okay and the next goal would be to after that would be to uh, find a formula for cross section where all this information will go in so that you can come out with a prediction for experiments and you can measure there okay so we'll stop here and we'll talk more about these things in the next video